I hear the rumble of thunder. Like a cry from six feet under. And I stifle a sob at the turn of the knob. And sanity torn asunder. The party of young revellers sat warming themselves around the hearth on that Christmas Eve of 1883, joyously engaged in the sharing of ghost stories as per tradition and inclination, the belief, commonly held at the time, being that ghostly apparitions could not intrude upon Christmas Day and, therefore, no matter how gruesome the tale told, all participants were guaranteed a restful night's sleep, if only on that one night of the rolling year. The creme de la creme of the beau monde had assembled at the country mansion of Lord Godolphin Tish to celebrate the Yuletide season. Merriment and generous portions were guaranteed, and invitations highly desired, as only the cultivated flowers of the upper classes were so honoured. Lord Tish was wont to justify the narrow parameters of his guest list by stating he believed Christmas was a time for youth and beauty, and that the old and ugly were welcome to the rest of the year. By its very nature, the small circle gathered together at these annual events was frequently replenished with fresh blood, and notable amongst that category was a handsome young German composer, Hippolyte Rhino. His forte being gloomy leader for solo male baritone and piano, and his contribution to the evening entertainment thus far was the interpolation of his morbid dirges between tales, attracting throughout the most sedulous regard from those assembled, both male and female. It now came his turn to share a ghostly yarn, and, though he tried to decline, protesting that he had already sung for his supper, the young ladies in particular were having none of it, and begged him to contribute a German yarn, and so, reluctantly, he acquiesced to their wishes. The effect of some reluctance was evident in the knit of his brow and his eyes cast down, but thus obliged, he began his tale, albeit with a dignified reserve. Is vor ein Mal, he began in his native tongue, an artist by the name of Siegfried von Bona, who was intimately known to me, having been childhood playmates, who had grown up together in the Loisach Valley, in the shadow of Bergwank, and with whom I had later journeyed to Berlin to establish ourselves artistically, taking up shared lodgings in Frieden now. Siggy specialised in self-portraiture having failed to find any model as handsome as he and his studies of a classical nature quickly found great favour with the rich elderly male art collectors not only in his adopted city but wherever rich elderly male art collectors congregate Berlin's well-to-do, who desired a home close to the city centre, yet surrounded by countryside, saw that dream realised in the exclusive upscale suburb of Zellendorf, an oasis of tranquillity connected to the bustling city centre by quick and convenient tram service. That exclusive enclave is characterized by its magnificent mansions and resplendent abodes that are constructed in all manner of architectural styles from ancient to modern, and at 82 Pinkelstrasse stands one such imposing erection, a Tudor Gothic revival-style castle, though on a smaller scale, complete with a moat, a drawbridge, battlements, and towers. It was the home of Jürgen Klanger, the wealthy art critic and connoisseur whose eccentricities were said to be part of his charm, though more so was his bank balance. 
Herr Klanger had certainly charmed Ziggy by acquiring several of his solo nude studies, and had subsequently invited him on the December morning in question to his private abode in order to discuss a commission he had in mind, a pastoral study of the biblical friendship betwixt David and Jonathan. Ziggy was to portray Jonathan with Jürgen himself featured as King David and it was to that end that they spent the greater part of the day engaged in assuming a variety of novel and athletic poses to be sketched in advance of the oil on canvas. Their artistic exertions had, however, left them somewhat spent due to the fact that the day had been extremely muggy. A storm had been brewing, and as it built inexorably, Clanger strove to encourage Siegfried to pack up his sketchbook and pens and make haste to head home before it broke, but as Ziggy dallied, the oppressive atmosphere gave way to a profound air of gloom as the winter afternoon drew on and darkness quickly fell. Of the two, Klanger was significantly more affected by the lewd atmosphere, his enthusiasm and gay good humour having evaporated. He seemed desperately out of sorts ere the storm burst like a vengeful balloon over the castle ramparts. Thunderclaps erupted from the continuous rumble. The lashing rain fell in torrents, swelling the waters of the moat that encircled the property whilst the sheets of lightning reflecting upon its surface lent a deeper shade of horror to the pitch darkness that followed in their fake, and the dogs in their kennels began to howl piteously. Any thought that the storm might quickly pass were dashed as it raged on and on and on and on to a point at which Ziggy frankly grew bored. But Clanger was not of the same mind. He grew increasingly apprehensive, even terrified. You suffer from astrophobia? Siegfried asked him, concerned for Clanger's mental balance. If only, Clanger retorted, no. I do not suffer from an extreme and irrational fear of thunder and lightning. My fear may be extreme, but it is in no way irrational, mein Herr. But then declined to elaborate further. The continuance of the storm meant Sigi was effectively trapped within the castle walls, and so had little choice but to accept Clangel's offer to join him at dinner. Conversation proved difficult due to the reverberant claps of thunder which threatened to reduce the building to rubble, though Siegfried tried to no avail to jolly his companion out of the funk into which he had sunk. With the clock striking ten and the storm instead of abating having only increased in ferocity, it was with a resignation bordering on apathy that Siggy accepted his host's somewhat reluctant offer of a bed for the night, rather than brave the horrors of the tempest, and was shown to a bedchamber adjacent to his sponsors. Clanger then bid him good night, before anxiously retreating to his room. Having climbed into bed, it was some time later that Ziggy heard, to his alarm, a terrified scream from next door, and rushed without hesitation to the aid of his host, who lay abed and asleep, but was clearly in the throes of some hideous nightmare his limbs flailing against some unseen opponent. Ziggy shook him awake, and after struggling for some time to compose himself, Clanger exclaimed, You do not merit the horrors that this night will bring, dear Siegfried, be gone. The punishment should be suffered by I, and I alone. It is my due, though hideous destiny, not yours. What do you mean, sir? The storm rages all around us, there is nowhere to go, replied Siegfried, alarmed, but also equally concerned for his patron's mental welfare. 
Let us face the terrors of the night together, and may I comfort you with my presence until such time as the storm passes over us. And here Siegfried climbed into the bed alongside the distraught Kleiner. You do not understand, Jürgen ejaculated, wringing his hands. It was never my intention that you should witness the absolute terror that is to come. I had hoped you would be long gone and all set to immortalize me in oils a short time after I met my dread end. Dread end, sir? You know nothing of the nature of this horrible night. It is the anniversary of... Ah, but if I am to tell you, you must first swear an oath to secrecy upon your life. And soon enough, your own experience will add conviction to the terror that gnaws upon my very soul. Then, leaping out of bed and racing to the half-open door, he slammed it shut, locked it forthwith, and popped the key down the front of his lap and zoo. Ziggy then watched with mouth agape as Klanger whipped from the wall the crucifix that hung above the bed and thrust it into his hands. Swear, Klanger cried, swear upon your life that what I am about to share with you will never leave this room. Swear. And Siegfried swore. And Jürgen shared. And it never left the room. At that very moment, the ominous clang of the hall clock began to herald the midnight hour, and it barely struck the last resounding bong ere the slow, heavy, echoing footsteps began descending the stone staircase from above, making their way inexorably towards the locked room wherein two piteous creatures clung to each other, trembling and sobbing in fright. Finally there came the turning of the knob, and despite its sturdy fastening, the door of the room in which they were crouching slowly creaked open on its hinges, and in the next moment Siegfried shrieked, and his mind, recoiling in terror, collapsed in upon itself, and he fainted clean away. He awoke the next morning to discover himself lying on the bed in his own room, fully dressed. The storm having abated, he quickly fled the accursed abode without a backward glance and hastened back to our shared apartment in Friedenau, where, upon the opening of the door, he fell into my arms in a deathly swoon, and I put him directly to bed. The doctor was called, and initially Siegfried appeared to respond to treatment, but no sooner had he recovered his memory of the dread event than he relapsed into insensibility. Despite my staunchest attempts to nurse him back to health, I could not prevent him becoming the victim of a brain fever which, within a matter of days, saw that bright and vital young man shuffle off this mortal coil. However, during a short period of lucidity, he had shared with me the tale I now relate, but declined to discuss that which he had sworn not to reveal. Alas, it was the very memory of what he had been told and what he consequently witnessed that had eventually driven him to delirium and death. It needs only to be said that Clanger preceded him to the grave, having been discovered dead in his bedroom on the day Ziggy returned home, his head impaled atop a six-foot spruce tree and his torso unceremoniously vanned up the chimney, with his entrails draped around the room in an obscene parody of Christmas trimmings. 
Rhino closed his eyes at the completion of his tale, and shuddered at the images that played upon the back of his eyelids. Had anyone dropped a pin, it would have been heard. Then, lifting his head, he opened his eyes and gazed upon his audience. All the ladies in attendance appeared to have fainted in shock, whilst the gentlemen stared wide-eyed, open-mouthed, and pale-faced into the fire. Finally, Hippolyte broke the uncomfortable silence. And for my next song, uh, 